is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Wednesday, August 10th, 2016, and we're in Jefferson County, Oklahoma, uh, really close to Warica, interviewing Terry Stewart Forst as part of our Cowboys in Every County Oral History Project. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, ma'am. Glad to be here. Well, let's learn a little bit more about you. Could you tell me the year you were born and where you were born? I was born in August of 1954 and was actually born in Oklahoma City. Okay. And tell me a little bit about your parents. Uh, my mother was from Atoka County. Uh, she was the youngest of seven kids. Her daddy ran cattle in Atoka County, traded a lot of cattle. Um, and she actually went to the university that is south of Stillwater. I can't recollect the name right now, but there's another one down there, where she met my dad, who actually did the same thing. And he was from Bryan County, where my grandmother was born, and uh, her family had been there since 1868. So we are longtime Bryan and Atoka County residents, and. Why I'm being in Jefferson County is a sto little bit later story, but um, that's where my parents both grew up and both went to Oklahoma University and met there. Even though they lived not very far apart, they met it in uh, Norman. Mm -hmm. And I guess the rest is history. So you grew up in Oklahoma City? And in Caddo, Oklahoma, which is where the ranch was. My grandfather passed away uh, when my dad was very, very young. He had um, acquired the Mid-Continent Life Insurance Company in Oklahoma City and my dad became president of that at 22 years of age. Um, and so we, I remember the stories that we possibly would live in Caddo and daddy would commute. There was a lot of conversation. Well, it ended up, we ended up in the city and came back home to Caddo, Oklahoma, which we always considered home. Um, every chance we got. So the schools you attended growing up, elementary school, where, where was that? I actually went to Cassidy High School, or Cassidy School in Oklahoma City. Okay. Um, and as a little girl, did you spend any time in the old mid-continent building? I did, which is now the, owned by the Oklahoma Historical Society. Oh, I spent lots of time. I've climbed stairs. I've pushed uh, the old, the entire upstairs. That wasn't an apartment for my grandmother and grandfather. Was just empty space, and we do when we stay with my grandmother. We would play out there, play cowboys and Indians, and horse rode horses up there, and all things like that. My my sisters and I. So yes, we were. We frequented every little nick and cranny in that building. <laughs> if those walls could talk. If those walls could talk. There were little girls running up and down and all through that on all sorts of hours. How many siblings do you have? I have three sisters. Okay. So tell me about school uh, growing up. I uh, went to Cassidy School. Was um, I really don't know to say. <laughs> was very active in sports, played, played uh, field hockey, softball, and at that time they had an event called speedball, and so I was, I loved to do that. I rode the entire time. We would go weekends. I, if anybody would just uh, let me be horseback, I was. I rode hunters and jumpers, I rode saddle horses, I rode Tennessee walkers. Uh, my dad started playing polo when I was eight years old, so I worked for him. Uh, hot walking horses and, and saddling and unsaddling for him. So uh, my parents divorced and daddy had a place north of town where we kept horses and so every time I wasn't in school I was typically out there horseback. So I have to tell a funny story on myself as a senior in high school you had an opportunity to have a free time and I had a four door no power steering pickup that we used to pull the trailer to back and forth to Norman to the Broad Acres Polo Field. And that was the vehicle I was allowed to take all the kids to school in, and, but no power steering. So I'm sneaking out of the parking lot in, in the afternoon with a pickup that's no power steering. I've always wondered how I got away with it, but I went to Daddy's and rode all afternoon. 
most every afternoon, and I wasn't really supposed to be gone, but I did. <laughs> Polo is not a sport I hear a lot about in Oklahoma. Is it? Is it pretty big? It is now. Was fit relatively small then. My daddy was a fine horseman, and he took up polo, which was wonderful. He ran uh, field trial dogs when I was little, so we did a lot of that. And then as he got older, he he decided to learn polo, and he was very very good uh, because he could ride so well. So we uh, he needed a groom and a hot walker and enlisted me, although I really was, I wanted to go ride with a lady by the name of Suzanne Jones in New Mexico. She trained, she had been an Olympian at one point in time and I was friends with her daughter and I wanted to show quarter horses and none of that was working out too good and one day daddy just said, if you want to go show horses, go get a horse out of the Aramuda and take it to the horse shows and that's kind of how I got off in the horse show business and, but he let me have uh, we all each had a horse that was in name or in, we weren't, it was never registered in our name, but we, it was ours. And the one that was mine ended up in the, was inducted into the Hall of Fame two years ago, the American Quarter Horse Association Hall of Fame. Her name was Miss T. Stewart, and I picked her out when I it was in 19, she was born in 1961. So I always followed her cults, and I was very interested in the breeding and a lot of things that were going on. And Daddy never really encouraged us to participate in the ranch, although we were there all the time. We got to go a lot of the times, but I always had the feeling if I'd been a boy, I would have gotten to go a whole lot more. So I just made a nuisance of myself and went anyway. <laughs> Um, were you active in 4-H or FFA? No, Cassidy didn't have that, and so I just showed horses. So I was not fortunate enough to have that background, okay. uh, but my kids certainly have, and I've always, I, lots of kids that I know obviously uh, have been involved, and I think it's one of the finest, both are the finest organizations. Daddy was actually very instrumental in 4-H, the foundation, and uh, which was kind of ironic because I, he never encouraged us really to participate, but he was very involved in a, in a big promoter and advocate of the 4-H program in Oklahoma. Hmm. Well, it's, it's time for you to go to college. Your parents went to school at the other university. Correct. And you chose I never State? There was never any doubt in my mind where I wanted to go and never any doubt in my mind what I wanted to do. How so? I uh, knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was going to go to Oklahoma State University and major in animal science and why I had to live in the city and go to Cassidy School, I never did understand. But I did, and it was all right. But um, And actually, my grandfather was was on the Board of Regents at Oklahoma State University. And for Daddy to... I think the reason then is um, the business college at OSU at that time may not have been what it is today. And I think Oklahoma University at that time had a more... Um, maybe a better business degree. So there, I'm going to give him that excuse. Maybe. Daddy wrote calves during the time he was at OU anyway, and it was closer to Caddo, and he was going back and forth. I can't find any good reason. I'm trying to help him out on this situation. <laughs> so um, that's the best I can do. So they, um, I did. I knew exactly where there was nobody else in my class that went there, and um, that was all right. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned your your grandfather being on the board of regents, and you know, you know, I read somewhere that even uh, President Bennett wrote a book about he did. your grandfather. Yes, he did. What a great he time! He did. I'll, you are welcome to see one before you leave. <laughs> I don't have to have any extra. If we did. Well, we'll send it up there. Yes, uh, my dad, granddad was. They always called him Colonel, and. Uh, I think the name of this is Colonel Stewart, a gentleman from Texas. My grandfather didn't know him as well as I wish I would have. Both my grandfathers actually were were very dynamic men. And my daddy's dad died when I was four. Um, my mama's daddy, we called Big Daddy, and he died, uh, I'm thinking I was six or eight, somewhere in that, that neighborhood. But he... As I said, he was quite the cowman, and Mama says he could do figures in his head. 
faster than anyone she had ever seen. He never wrote things down, but he could he could outtrade you so fast that I wish I had inherited that, I think, just being able, I was never much of a mathematician, but Big Daddy was. We had a scale house down on the what we call the Wapanooka Highway, which is Highway 7 outside of Atoka, or that runs, they lived west of town. And he had a scale house, little office down there on the highway. And we always called it Big Daddy's Playhouse. And he'd take us down there and I'm not really sure what we did. I'm sure we were in the way more than anything, but I just remember he was always happy to have us go with him. <laughs> so that was good things. So before enrolling at OSU, did you ever spend any time in Stillwater much? Or? Oh, I would think so, but not really to go up and have that. I, I didn't really need to spend time. I knew where I was going. Okay. <laughs> I didn't need to look around. I didn't need to. I I truly never had any doubt, reservation, second thoughts. Uh, just I, okay. this is a done deal. So you're going to Stillwater. How do you get there? Are you driving your own vehicle? Well, my parents had divorced, as I had mentioned, and uh, my mother had remarried in 1970. She remarried right before I got graduated from high school, and my we decided I was going to move home, which was Caddo. So I, the day she left, I packed, or the day I graduated, I was already packed, and I moved to Caddo. Mm -hmm. So I spent that summer in Caddo and um, left from Caddo whatever day it was that I was supposed to go to Stillwater, and actually had already found a two stalls uh, east of town. And I'm going to be really remiss because I cannot remember the family's name and I feel terrible. Or maybe before the interview is over, I can. But I found two stalls, so I packed my truck and trailer and off I went. And my mother was adamant that I go through the sorority thing. And I think it was because I just didn't know anybody and she was a little apprehensive on me maybe doing what I wanted to do. I don't know. So I agreed. And I chose a sorority that's parking lot was big enough for me to park my truck and trailer and I met a girl from Panhandle, Texas and a girl from Perryton, Texas and they both rodeoed and we're okay. I don't remember everybody else but uh, I thought this is a go this will be all right. So and they put up with me and I wasn't I was not the model sorority person at all any way shape or form. Just never did fit in but it's okay. I made some good friends and lifelong friends. Which sorority? Kappa Kappa Gamma, of which my daughter-in-law was a very good member. <laughs> I think she said, yeah, your picture's up there, but there's a big black X on it. <laughs> but it was kind of funny because I remember taking Dr. Gunther's class, which we called Blood and Guts at the time. And I came in, I was probably not real clean, but I had to come through the middle of the sorority house to go upstairs and I think by that time they just shook their head. It was a place for me to sleep and that was about it. <laughs> Did you start living in the house as a freshman? Had, had, no, I lived in Wilhelm, okay. which I guess is no longer there. Mm -mm. I did. Lived on the 11th floor with a girl from Lawton, Oklahoma, Patty Cox. Mm. And we didn't get along all that well because Patty was a late nighter and I was up at 3 o'clock so we, our hours were clashing and we changed roommates at midterm and um, it's remained good friends all through school. Just kind of shuffled around. We found light, late nighters and early morningers and did some little shuffling. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about some of the classes you remember, some of your professors. You bet. I remember very, very well. I had introductory animal science with Bob Noble. I had meets with Lowell Walters. Um, I had I had the best animal science professors in the whole wide world. As a senior, it was Dr. Tadashek's last uh, year before he became department department head, and he took Gerald Callahan and I to lunch one day and picked our brains. And I, I'll never forget it. Dr. Tadashek probably had as much impact on my life as. Anybody. Dr. Gunther did too. J.J. Gunther was there and he was my advisor. 
And I remember walking into his little cubicle and he goes, I had the impression he did not think women should be in, in animal science, you know, and there weren't very many of us then. Minnie Lou Bradley had kind of paved the way for us and she's, an, again, a mentor of mine and a dear, dear friend. Dear, dear friend. But it was kind of like, mm, Terry, why are you really here? What's your ulterior motive? And we became great friends. He became a very trusted advisor for me. But the first impression was, I have got to prove that to him that I am all in. I am business. I want to be as good as anybody here. But in my opinion, at that time, it wasn't okay to be good, as good as. You had to be better than. The, it was, and I, and I, maybe that wasn't reality, but it was my perception. And I wanted to be the best I could be. Um, very, very fortunate. I had Dr. Wagner for nutrition. I, I had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Whiteman for statistics. I, I, I mean, and I made a four point. I mean, they pushed me. They did everything that I, I didn't all the way through, but I finally got my act together and decided I was, you know, was going to be. My grades were going to reflect the way I felt about everything. Uh, but the one small funny story. I walked to, which I don't speak in public, I hate it, it drives me crazy. This is the reason. <laughs> I, always, I always disclaim this whenever I talk to anybody. I said, all right, y'all, uh, I have signed up for speech because you're supposed to have that before you graduate, right? All right, so I walk over there to the building and there's a sign on the door, this class this hour has been canceled, great. So I go back to Dr. Gunther and I said, Dr. Gunther, I can't do speech. They've canceled the class, I have no place else to put it. What do I do? He said, don't worry about it. We're gonna put you in livestock entomology and that'll cover your class. So I learned a lot about ticks. In fact, I studied with Dr. Jakey Hare, who was doing major tick research at the time, and he offered me a position, which meant I wouldn't graduate for another year. I would work for him for a year. I, was, I turned it down because I thought, I am, I want to go home. I want, I, I just was ready to leave and pursue some other interest when college was over. Best time of my life, probably. The people that I met there, I still do business with today. I still know today. I still call today. Um, Mike Armitage is a very, very dear friend, and he, we went to, we went through school together, and we still do a lot of business together. I mean, it's Gerald I respect immensely. Uh, we had a lot of, a lot of fun, but you know, I was so fortunate to be in school with people that the caliber of people that they are today. They were then too, and to, you know, you surround yourself with people that are better than you. You'll rise to the occasion, and what a, what a neat deal. And even a lot of the girls in the Kappa House, pretty special girls. <laughs> well, you mentioned Minnie Lou. Yes. And Minnie Lou was on the rodeo team. Did you participate no, in any we clubs? Didn't, we didn't have anything. I was OSU oh, rodeo queen one year. Uh -huh. I, I'm really not sure how I got roped into that one because <laughs> All of a sudden, I just was, and how did that happen? No, because I showed quarter, oh, clubs, yes. Sorry about that. Uh, not the rodeo club, because at that time, because Mary Eileen went, did a lot of the rodeo thing. A lot of those guys just paid their own way. Yeah. Um, I was showing quarter horses, which was enough, was enough different that I didn't rodeo, but I showed AQHA classes in the youth and all those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> the block and bridle. Mm -hmm. I was in. Um, hmm. That's probably it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was. I don't think I can't remember if I did anything else. I was. I was so busy with my horses because I had those two up there, and block and bridle kept me pretty busy, too. And so I didn't probably venture out as much as I may have may have been able to. But I went home a lot uh, weekends and when I could. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Dr. Tadachek, and yes. we lost him a couple of years yes, ago. Um, any fond memories you recall? You mentioned a little bit of your interactions with him. Oh, over the years, we stayed in constant contact. I mean, he was very involved with the Oklahoma Cattlemen's, and I ended up being the president of the Oklahoma Cattlemen's. Um, but we stayed in a lot of contact, and he was always very encouraging. I kept every letter he ever wrote me, hmm. and he really believed in me mm -hmm. a lot. And always encouraged me and always was 
you just knew if you ever, and I called him a couple of times about things that I would be questioning, and, and, and to me that was so much of what I got at OSU, the, the feeling that, all you gotta just pick up the phone. I, and everybody was so open and so willing, and so Bob Kropp was livestock judging coach at that time. And what a treat, what a treat our friendship has been over these years. Uh, I can't even, I can't even tell you what Bob Crop means to me. He's just, and Keith Lusby, he was Dr. Tadashek's graduate assistant before he went to Arkansas, but that was the last, then he, he had, he, had um, he was his graduate assistant, so I had Dr. Tadashek and Keith Lusby in the same beef production, or beef, what was it, beef science, beef cattle science class. How do you get any better than that? I mean, the icons of the animal science industry are all in this little building here, with the old AH building, <laughs> which I loved. But they were all there, every one of them. And all you had to do is walk in the door and they would answer any question, visit, encourage. Mm -hmm. I, I will, Dr. Tadashek taught me one of the biggest lessons I ever learned, and he didn't even know it at the time. That was, we were in the judging class and I was really timid as far as speaking my mind and I just I don't know why I was just not very aggressive on things like some of those things and we had judged a class don't even remember what it was and I was going to give him my reasons he looked me square in the eye and he said really I, I think I wanted to turn around and cry I will never forget him but that wasn't what he was asking me. He was, he, what he would do, that, what that was, was are you, be, con, be, be sure, have convictions, stand by your principles. I mean, there was so much in that one word that he asked me, really? All I'd do was say, yes, sir. And that would have been it. But I didn't. But I learned a big lesson that day, a very big lesson. We never talked about it, but I told him it, it bothered me a long time and many years later I think it was at the Oklahoma, one of the Oklahoma Cattlemen's conventions I shared that I said I learned something from you that day and it changed a lot for me yeah hmm. right wrong or different I'm gonna make a decision and I'm gonna tell you exactly what it is <laughs> it may not be right but uh, that was an incredible lesson for me that day hmm. well you were quite busy with horses and school did you work at all? Like a I did. I worked for the ranch. I okay. I was I did do that because the horses I had up there were ranch horses, and I would start two year olds for my dad or things like that. So I didn't. Uh, I'd spent some time at Oklahoma Beef Incorporated, um, and I helped out there quite a bit. So, but I I wasn't. Um, I sh my job really. Daddy had wanted me to take extra horses up there. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did for him. Well, did you have time for fun? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Sometimes too much fun. <laughs> we had a group that spent a lot of time dancing at Lee Dots, which has probably been condemned, but we, uh, I had some really good friends from West Texas and New Mexico, and they could all dance. So we made it a point to try to make Lee Dots to dance on Wednesdays and Saturday nights when we were in town. Hmm. A lot of fun. Um, I went, I, I think really most of my, again, involved with Block and Bridal and a lot of things like that. So, I mean, that was, thoroughly enjoyed everybody that was involved in that and all the activities we did regarding that. So. That, enc that encompassed a lot of the time I was on campus, and um, heck, I'm trying to remember what else I did, probably. I was, I was really burned out on sports by the time I got to school. Mm -hmm. I'd been really successful in high school. I won dang near all the upper achievement awards. They pushed me really hard. My knees hurt. Um, I, I really had had all that I wanted, so I didn't get, in hindsight, maybe I wish I had done a little bit, because I enjoyed it, but it just, I was burned up, burned up, burned out, didn't want to do that. And all I wanted to do was write, and I think I tried to find every way, every avenue I could to pursue my 
horse dream, whatever that at that time really was. I wanted to show quarter horses. I, I really did. And the, the kids that showed quarter horses that at that time, a lot of all-around horses, a lot of um, parents buying horses, got kids really nice horses. And if I was going to do it, I was going to just have to get figure out to get what was out in the pasture and learn for myself. I wanted to do it that bad. Hmm. So that's what I did. I got a lot of gates, and they, all the other kids liked to see me show up because I was a class filler, and you just have to be honest about it. <laughs> but it's okay. I learned a lot. And last year, I was uh, reserve champion at Snapple Bit Futurity, uh, won the intermediate non-pro championship, won the novice non-pro championship, and it's not bad for well, someone's a little long in the tooth, but there's... It's just, you, you, it's okay to have dreams. You don't ever give up on them. You just keep working. Because they may not happen in your time. Mm -hmm. It's hard work. Hard work. Mm -hmm. Don't quit. <laughs> well, you're, you're approaching graduation. Mm -hmm. Any idea what you want to do? Mm -hmm. I was going home. I, Daddy had offered me a job. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have taken it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I would, although my, both of my boys did basically the same thing, I'm not sure it's always the best option for, for family operations. It worked out okay, but I did go home and I went to work for Dad uh, managing his horse program. Okay. I didn't, wasn't as well involved with the cattle in that part at that point in time. Helped, but wasn't as involved. Okay. So, graduation day, do you remember it? I do. Uh, Richard Nixon spoke. Oh. Isn't that right? Did you check it out? I think so. We had a president speak that day. That would, be the, Nixon that would be the president. 1972? Mm -hmm. Six. Mm -hmm. 1976, yeah. Lots of people there. Lots of people. We had it on the football field. Your parents come up? They did. They did. They were there, both there. Didn't sit together, but they were both there. <laughs> um, actually... I would have to think, Daddy became a regent sometime and then David Hall was governor. And I don't really remember what day it was. He may have actually been a regent when I went on when I left. I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. I'd have to double check on that. But he wasn't there a long time, but he was up there for a while. Well, you're, you're working for the family business. And so I kind of want to step back for a second and talk about the business and how we are in Jefferson County and also the operation in Caddo. Sure. Sure. If you could just kind of give us an you overview. <clears throat> uh, 1868 uh, would be my great, great grandfather settled in north of where the ranch headquarters is today and uh, married a Choctaw Indian. They were actually up around Boggy Depot at the time which is in between where my mother was raised and where my daddy was raised. Uh, they always laughed about Mama saying she was the Boggy Bottom Queen, but that's another story too. <laughs> but um, my grandmother was born on the ranch. Her father was a district judge, or circuit judge, in Blue County Indian Territory. My grandmother actually went to the women's Choctaw Women's Academy um, so we were have Choctaw, uh, Choctaw heritage. So she was on the original Dawes Commission rules. Um, she married my grandfather. Um, I can't exactly remember how old she was, but she took two of her brothers to Oklahoma City. She was the only girl in her family. Her father actually had two families. His first wife died, and he had quite a few, I can't remember exactly how many kids, and then he married my great-grandmother, Josephine Baxter of which my grandmother was the only daughter. But she was the third oldest, I believe. Anyway, she raped, she helped with a lot of the younger boys and took two of them to Oklahoma City to go to school. Went to work at the Mid-Continent Life Insurance Company where she met my grandfather and they married and then my father was born, he was the only child. Daddy was very interested in the ranch and he probably assumed a lot of the responsibility down there. Um, Dean Blizzard actually came down with that one. There's a picture right around the corner of Dean Blizzard and my grandfather and daddy in a, cow, in a, in a set of pens down there sorting cows. It's kind of neat, but um, 
My grandfather would never adhere to the smaller Hereford cattle. He wouldn't go that route. And so we never got caught in a lot of the dwarfism situation that happened back in those days. And, uh, but that was just kind of a, he liked the bigger frame Hereford cows, and we always never did really lose that. Um, my, when my grandmother and grandfather married, my grandfather and daddy eventually assumed ownership of the ranch. Uh, my grand, I apologize there. My grandfather had, my great grandfather had given the home place to my grandmother, and uh, the other boys had different areas. But um, best I can recollect, and this is hearsay, I'm not really sure if it is right or wrong. My grandfather was doing very well and had opportunities to buy pieces of land adjacent to where my grandmother's place was, which put the ranch basically together. Uh, still, Freeney Valley is what we've always called it. My grandmother was Freeney. Daddy operated the ranch uh, till I got out of school, basically, and he was kind of ready to do other things and not be as involved, and so I kind of, he really hired managers or people or to kind of oversee things and I helped them and that was we went through three or four it was not good just don't think they had respect for me overseeing them and some things like that I'm not really sure so uh, probably in the early 80s we 80 Two, three, somewhere in there. We had a really bad drought down there, and Daddy wanted me to haul water, so we did. And I thought you can't, you can't haul enough water to ever do that. And so I started pursuing some different ideas. I went through Stan Parsons Grazing for Profit School. I studied a lot of Alan Savory's information. Got involved with the Noble Foundation over here. Um, they were still very small, just four men on board at the time, and. Um, obviously used my OSU contacts to help really, I decided, I mean, and at, with Dad's blessing, it tried to run the ranch because I didn't like the way it was going. I didn't like a lot of things that were happening. And um, we disagreed a lot on things, a whole lot. But I kind of started getting my education on grazing management and, and things like that. I took a course with Clinton Owensby at Kansas State. It was a VHS course in grazing management. I don't remember the ranch. I can't remember exactly the name of the course. I actually still have the tapes, I think. But I, he was a very well, well respected ranch scientist back in those days. Spent a lot. My mother was very, um, had dealt with Texas Tech a lot. So I met a lot of those guys. And fortunately, got to ask a lot of questions and I learned a lot. My dad and I then had a real big disagreement. Enough, I quit. I'm not sure if he fired me or I quit, but it was kind of all at the exact same time. And that would have been 1989, and I left. Um, things at the ranch got didn't really go well. We, but he had had. had things, there were some problems developing, cow herd problems other things. So I was gone several years. I had decided to pursue a um, real estate, get a real estate license and sell ranches. Well, in the interim, I, all I wanted to do was really go home. So I picked up the phone one day, and this is a very interesting call, and, or, and I called TCU Ranch Management. And I said, I am interested in your program. I now have two kids. I'm divorced or separated. I'm not divorced at this time. And I, I'm nuts, granted, totally. How in the world am I going to pay for this? So, But I call, and they say, well, we'll send you an application. That afternoon, I get a phone call back. And they said, could you be here tomorrow for an interview? Yes. She said, you can fill out your application while you're here. We just had a cancellation. You don't think God doesn't work in mysterious ways. I'm going to tell you exactly how he does. I said, sure. So I called the lady I was working for, and I said, can I take off tomorrow? Mama kept my kids, and I went over there for an interview. 
uh, John Merrill was there, who, is, who became, for me, probably one of the most instrumental people in my life. Dr. Tadashek, John Merrill, there. I don't know how I was so gifted to have those kind of men help me through things. Uh, what a blessing. So I had my interview, and we fill out the application, and okay, that's enough said. And um, This is in August, and for the next school year. So things rock along, and I get a letter in December that says I've been accepted. Okay, now what do I do? I don't have a place to live, my kids are in school. I was renting a house in, I was actually had moved to Dallas to do some things, that's the whole story, but I was in Dallas at the time. Uh, working for a real estate company. My mother was there to help me with the kids. That was why I was there, because I had no help. And so <laughs> I accept. <laughs> if it's gone this far, we'll figure it out. And um, some really tough things happened about April of that year. And Dr. Mer John Merrill called, not, he wasn't a doctor, John Merrill calls me and he says, Terry, are you really sure this is what you need to do? Well, I said, absolutely. I'm doing it. I'm not really sure. Also, that about that year, I sold three horses. One of them was Genuine Red Bud, who ended up being the super horse. Uh, and two others were reigning horses that had gotten very, very good. Tim McQuay helped me sell them. I had my tuition in hand. I still didn't know where I was going to live, but I had my tuition. So I said, no, this is going to all work out. So we um, rock on. I have a pilot. I went through a real estate agency. I found a pilot who had lived in Fort Worth that wanted to try to live in Dallas for a year. We switched houses, except that his didn't cost, the rent on his was not nearly what the rent on mine was. And so it was, I had enough money to be able to have, it, it was just, really, really awesome. Now, how often does that work for a year? Uh, there was one position at a kindergarten that my mother said she would pay for, because I couldn't go to public school because we started school without, we were, I drove for 30 days wow. to school. So I couldn't put them in a public school because I didn't live anywhere. But we found a kindergarten with an after school till five o'clock, till I got out of school. And there was one position open at a TCU four-year-old or three-year-old program however old Robert was, across the road. That doesn't happen either. And I started school. So I, the big joke always was, for then I had one orange coat and one purple coat, and it was, okay, where are your allegiances? I will always, I don't care, <laughs> bleed orange. <laughs> so we made a big joke about that, but it was fun. Went through the TCU program, came, and my father actually contacted me. When I got out, I had found, he had found a ranch he wanted me to look at. I was going to do ranch appraisals and put together management plans. And he called me to do one for him. And after I did it, we made a deal. I told him I would come back to work for him. He wanted to hire me back. But only if, under these circumstances, and I was going to have to change the profitability of the ranch and put it into a very productive. We had parameters lined out. If I didn't reach those, I was going to leave. I mean, I, it was not going to work. And he, we agreed to it, and I did it. And that's when I became the general manager. And I feel like that we've done, we, because it's a team effort, I have a great team. You always surround yourself with people who are better at things than you are. And if you can do that, I think you run a successful organization. Well, I think you're, you know, when we look at your career here, you instituted some key practices to really help the profitability of the ranch. What were some of those things that you changed or implemented? Sure, big time. And mm -hmm. I think the, one of the primary things we did, we were calving oh, virtually nine months out of the year. The bulls might get pulled, they might not. I mean, they'd start calving in September and we were still having calves May, you know, just things weren't succinct. And the first thing I did when I came back to work for him was divide our calving seasons. And we went in with a veterinarian, came over to help me, and in December we, we literally 
palpated cows, this one's before December 31st, this one's January 1st, and divided them that way. Sure, we missed some. And it took us probably three years, best I can recollect, to get things really right and, and even, but I moved the spring cows on and into a, I got them into a 60-day calving season pretty quick. February and March, we moved the falls back to September and October. Got them pretty quick. We had a lot. Of, we had some other problems with the cows too, and, it, and as I said, it probably took us three or four years to get through a lot of those things. But we did it, and um, I shortened them back to 75 days, and then went on to 60. Today, I wouldn't mind. I could go to 45, and it probably wouldn't bother us a bit. Uh, in all honesty, so we've tightened our calving seasons down. That helped immensely because it that helped us. Feed. It, I mean, we got control over a lot of things, and I thought if we can't get control over things, which with the, that kind of calving season, uh, it was we went in and tagged all of our cows. Um, we they, so everybody had a number, and if you saw the calf with that cow, and she was not a little sorry doggy calf with a cow, that cow's number got wrote down, and she was out of here. We couldn't call everything at one time, obviously, because that was not going to be an economic situation. Um, Daddy and early on had plowed up a lot of the really good bottom land over there because of university uh, encouragement to plant fescue, Bermuda grass through all these native grass bottoms when we destroyed them. The pecan sprouts today and persimmon are things that we fight unbelievably. They cr it created a lot of problems. Not that it wouldn't have happened maybe to some extent, but not like it did once you tilled that ground. So we've got a lot of problems that we're developing over those. So we have range issues, we had cow issues. Um, got that pretty much taken down. Then we ended up, um, when, when Daddy hired me back, we, we purchased 11,000 acres over here, which is about the middle part of it. I hired a man that was at TCU with me. Jay Adcock came and helped me put this place together. And we started with, um, bought a set of cows to come in over here. We hotwired the nine sections out there and did a little rotational grazing because they'd been leased and there was a lot of areas that were looked like they had been leased and needed some reconstructive situations. So we went to work and worked hard and got, uh, got a lot of things done. Uh, increased, we were able to increase our wheat pasture. Daddy had always farmed cattle out to wheat pasture in this country. Now we had our own opportunity to run wheat. I'm not a farmer, never pretended to be. I've learned a lot. I always laughed. I said, I drove by the Howards. If they're plowing, okay, y'all, we got to plow. You know, it was kind of, let's go see what the Howards are doing, and that's what we're going to do. So that's kind of how it started. But that was a wonderful example to follow. If I could follow anybody that was really good, it was the Howards. So we've come a long way since then. I've learned a lot. Um, still run Black Baldies and Herefords. Uh, 2011 was a whole different year. It changed our lives again. I've been through some droughts. Thought I was pretty good on drought. Uh, John Merrill told me, you cannot feed or water your way out of a drought, and you better have a drought plan. Most important piece of advice I have ever been given, I had one. I had a drought plan, and we worked it. We worked. If we didn't have rain by this day, this was what we did. If we didn't have rain by this day, this is what we did, and we did every bit of it. It wasn't easy, it was tough, it was broke my heart a couple of times, but that's what we did. And um, we got through it with a lot of grass. And our cow herd is down. We chose to capitalize on the high prices these last couple of years. So we haven't rebuilt our cow herd quite like everybody else did. We sold a lot of heifers, uh, kept our older cows and sold our heifers because our, in my opinion, longevity is a real good is very important in our herd, but the older cows are your producers. They're the ones that if they've been here, we don't allow a cow to miss a calf. So if you've got a six, seven year old cow, she's kicking your cow at calf out every year. And in my opinion, they were the ones I needed to keep and we sold the heifers instead. So we have we had big fall herd at that time. We had about 800 cows in the fall herd and about, oh, I probably 1,300 in the spring. Uh, our fall herd got pulled down a lot because they were the cows that could do the shuffling and we even sent cows to another part of the country uh, hoping to salvage some herds and 
um, didn't work out as well as we hoped and just learned a lot through that time but we but we did we did make it we, we did all right um, we're building now through these lower prices is kind of when we're going to put our herds back together and the um, eliminate our fall cow herd for a little while we hmm. had an opportunity to sell a lot of fall cows this last year did and I think well we'll just go to one do a spring herd for a while with us, it seems like we are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months of the year because you're branding spring calves and then weaning fall calves at, fit calves at the same time. Come, we're going to start weaning our spring calves, spring calves August 22nd. Well, our fall calves are going to start calving, so you've got all that. Uh, we participate in uh, Snapple Bit Paturity in Reno, Nevada, which is coming up, which I was telling you about I did pretty good at last year, so that's coming and we're riding horses crazy hours that start about one because it's not so hot and Bob's crew will, will join Bob up at daylight to go wean, wean process and palpate cows starting there. It'll take us six weeks to go through. We only wean about 200 a week but it's worked really really well for us. Five years ago we started no-tilling and we're working with cover crops seeing how that gets along so I, we're changing a lot. Uh, one other thing we've done this year is for our Bryan County Ranch, because of the brush problem, we, we tried to run yearlings over there. It did had some success with that, uh, but you have to have a cow that is willing to penetrate a lot of the brush and problems we have over there. Um, the roping industry has gotten huge, and there's a big demand for coring any steers to meet all the demands of all this roping, where there's so much money involved. So we have gotten in the Coriani cow business, and they're all going to Caddo. Uh, just don't, my advice to people is absolutely open your eyes because there's lots of opportunities. You couldn't have paid to give me a Coriani cow 10 years ago. I would have said you are nuts. But when they're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars at these ropings, we've already made connections with the guys that buy the steers and furnish the cattle out. So we've already got an outlet for our steer calves. Um, I think it'll work out, plus mainly we've got brush control that requires very, very mm -hmm. little maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to have an A number one yearling man to go run a, herd of, uh, run a set of Korean cows. Uh, my oldest son Clay runs our outfitting division, which has, I, when he came home, he wanted to do that. He also went through the TCU program and was an OSU graduate. So that was, I have a funny story about Clay if it works in your program. But, oh, yeah. Um, run the outfitting. I said, I'm not giving you any money. I said, you can put what you get back in your program, but I don't have any money to give you. So he has taken this to be a huge part of our business. He has got sponsors with Cabela's, Yeti, a lot of the big name people. Um, we've got clients from California, uh, Alabama, uh, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, all over the United States, have Virginia, have flown in here to hunt deer, turkey, pigs, which is a nuisance here, but truthfully it's a good revenue for us and it helps. Um, we have a huge waterfowl development program now. We're on one edge of one of the flyways and Clay's done some remarkable enhancement development to some areas to increase our waterfowl. Lots of geese in here because there's so much wheat pasture through here. So a lot of geese will winter in here. So we just keep looking at opportunities. Uh, we're looking at some recreational opportunities too as we go down the road. Just keep your eyes open and grab those opportunities when they might present themselves, I think. Lots of diversification. Very much. It's what keeps us in business because just now, Calves that were worth fifteen hundred dollars three years ago are worth half that now. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not quite that, but still, there's a big, a big change in income. The horse programs, our horse program has really got developed. Um, so it seems like when we have we have cash flow on a regular basis, Clay's program, we're just we always look at ways to to not have to put all of our eggs in one basket. So cow calf. We also run yearlings. We run game cattle. We've owned yearlings. We've get, run them for other people. 
I think we just, the flexibility and not being tied down or locked into, well, we, this is the way we've always done it. That's the way we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. As long as you get out of that mindset, I think there's opportunity for uh, things to change or things to... Your, your operation today, it's about 40,000 acres? I think we're right. Look, take under 45, 44, somewhere in there. Okay. And you're the oldest ranch in the state of Oklahoma under continuous family ownership. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay. 1868. We'll be 150 years old in 2018. Wow. We're going to have a party. Are you going to have a big party? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I may have to come to your you big might, party. You might have to, absolutely. <laughs> we're, we're working on it right now. So I, if I don't run out of money between here and there, we're going to have a big party. So, yep, every we're, we'd like to try to include people that have helped us, been part of the ranch and uh, over the years and it's, 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 I think I better really put my head to the grindstone on getting it because I don't think this is going to be an easy undertaking. Mm -mm. <laughs> Good luck with that. I know it. It's kind of scary. <laughs> um, your sons are involved in the yes, operation today. Very much so. Uh, tell me a little bit about your sons. Uh, Clay graduated from Oklahoma State University with a degree in ag business, which we didn't have at that point in time. Uh, I've got to share just a little side story about Clay. We always thought he would go to Chicago and be an announcer for the Cubbies. He, this kid lived, breathed, ate baseball. And the Chicago Cubs were everything. His golden retriever's name is Wrigley. Does that have any indication still? loved baseball. I wish he had been good and he could have been a professional baseball player, but he played baseball all the way through. It just was not going to work out. So it's getting time to go to college and obviously Oklahoma State, again, there was never any doubt. We were, we were all OSU bound. And, um, I said, we well, was going to go to the college, business college. I said, well, when we went up for freshman day, and the gentleman that was manning the ag booth, whatever thing, you know, when you, they walk around, I happened to know. So we got to visiting and I introduced him to Clay. And Clay told him what he was going to do. And he said, well, you know, we have an ag business degree now. Clay kind of looked, but he was still not really wanting to, I really figured my kids would go as far away from here as possible because they had had to work every day of their lives. I mean, it was... They never had any opportunity to not, and I figured they would be gone. Uh, he kind of perked up. And so we were talking, and he said, let me share this with you. He said, a lot of the recruiters come to the College of Agriculture first for one reason, because most kids that go to the College of Agriculture have come from backgrounds where they learn to work. Which my kids, I can promise you, they learned to work and will work. And if you, uh, they'll work for whatever, <laughs> because that's the way they've been raised. So anyway, Clay ended up going to the College of Agriculture. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, he did the fraternity route and had a blast. Uh, his wife Lindsay was a kappa up there, actually dating a friend of his in school. And he went to school. He lived with Matt Carter, who. Matt's dad, Joe Carter, big OSU fan also, ends up being a veterinarian for us on down in small world. It's just, it's what I love about OSU because the circles and it's, uh, you may not have known that person then, but it's an opening and it's, we all feel the same way. I mean, we all love it so much and it's just, it's just the best thing ever. So Clay, uh, graduated and I encouraged him to go through TCU and he did apply and had a great experience there also. Came home, so he is, the runs Dirt Ranch Outfitters, it's its own company and does, he does the Facebook and wonderful, Clay is more of a, he doesn't mind doing the office things and He's a good promoter. He's very good at public relations. He's very um, likes pe very people oriented and does a good job. Laid back, calm. My antithesis, I guess, would be totally opposite. Now Robert, on the other hand, <laughs> my youngest, 
and it's probably way too much light. So we have, we kind of run crosswise sometimes. In fact, we told Clay, said, Clay, when you leave, you know Robert and I are either going to get along wonderfully or kill each other. Well, it worked out great, so. Um, Robert became very involved in the horses. He kind of did the wildlife for a while, went to Southeastern. Mm -hmm. um, Robert never really, was never, school was not his cup of tea. I personally, I don't think anybody ever challenged him enough. And so, because he can do anything with his hands, he can figure out equipment, uh, sharp as a tack, really, but just, I think he got really, really bored with school. Mm -hmm. Some of those teachers were okay, but as a rule, he was ready to, his, and he worked uh, for a construction company over in Durant, lived at, at our ranch and then commuted to Southeastern, worked for a construction company in the interim too, and by the end of the year I said, you've got to go one year. Uh, he did, and he was done. Ended up coming home and working with the horse program, and now he runs it, and is doing a remarkable job. I could not be prouder of him. He's, he is, he shows, does a very, very good job, is uh, one of the top, he's, he's not one of the million dollar riders or anything at that point in time, but he's certainly got the potential to become one of those if that's what he chooses to do. I think he, I don't think he'll pursue the horse training part of it as time goes on because there's more responsibilities. Just like uh, we're going to start weaning calves. Well, I think he's going to take a little more of the cattle management into his, under his wing. And what I, I see happening is Robert kind of becomes, for lack of a better official words, the operations manager and Clay does more of the financial operations. And I've involved them so much. I, as much as they want to be involved, I think sometimes they know, Mom, you just handle it kind of type thing, but try to keep them abreast of what's going on. And um, Robert's ideas about the Coriandi cows were his. I mean, it was Robert's idea about that. He presented me a very concrete plan, how he was going to put together. I let him buy the cows, do, do the whole thing, and hmm. he's, that's going to be his baby. So I'm very excited to see what they bring with new ideas. And, and I can run, been there, done that on them. You know what, I said, we did it this way. This didn't work. My suggestion to you would be to change up because this didn't work this way. I'm not going to tell you the whole plan won't, but let's look at how we get there possibly. And so we can, and sometimes I just say, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> won't work. Don't want to spend the money. It's the way it is. And I still have that prerogative, but um, it's it's been exciting and, and I'm, I can't tell you how blessed I feel for them to come home and want to come home and want to be a part of it. So why would I not encourage them to develop their ideas and to develop what they've learned and what I hope what hope what I hope I've taught them? And yes, they need a lot more experience. I got thrown into the fire without much direction, and that's tough. Mm -hmm. It's really really tough. Um, so I hope they always feel like they can lean on me for answers or questions or, and I and I hope to never be the kind of person that says. No, we can't do that. No, we can't. I don't want to, I want to say, yeah, but really come at me with how you could do it. Pretend like I'm the banker. And you've got to go pass it by somebody that knows nothing about your business. And we've tried to do some of that, and they've done a real good job doing it and have been very successful doing it. Do you have a lot of um, longtime employees who've worked for the family? Miss Jana? She's going to open the door. I knew she'd get up. How long have you been here? Uh, no, she asked me a question if we had any long-time employees. That's why I asked you. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Bob's been here nine, ten? Bob's been here nine or ten, maybe. Well, the, Bob Benton was our cow boss that just came in here. Mm -hmm. um, Blake. Blake's been here a long time. Yeah. yeah. But there's places we have some turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of, 
Brie, yeah, we, we've had a little issues with a little bit, but mo for the most part, and Rick Bagby, who has built everything on this ranch and everything over there, our, the construction company Robert went to work, same man has built everything. Rick worked for the ranch, lives on the back side of the ranch. He's unfortunately a couple years younger than me and rubs it in my face all the time. <laughs> Known each other since that long. So I would say that for the most part we have, we all, we've worked, we put together a good team and we've worked together a long time. I told him one time, I said, all right y'all, this is the deal. It was probably 2011 or 2012 and I was, I get, I go a little fast a lot of times, probably, eh, most of the time. Anyway, I said, okay, I got a deal, y'all. I was about to drive everybody crazy. And I knew I was, because I was driving myself crazy. So I said, okay, I got a deal. I'm gonna buy a shot collar, put it around my neck, and everybody gets a remote. <laughs> and when it gets way out of hand, just mm, zap me. <laughs> I said, yeah, you have to put it with it. And he asked, how would you like to live with this? Full time, 24 hours a day. But no, I have a great crew. And I do think you always look for people that Sure, I, and, and I would never ask anybody here to do anything I wasn't willing to do, ever, ever, ever. But there are a lot of things I don't do as well as men. There are a lot of things that, I mean, I, I am not a feminist in any way, shape, or form, but there are, there is nothing I wouldn't at least try. But I don't run equipment very good. I mean, I've hung up hairs on the fence post and pretty destructive. I don't like equipment. Not very good at it. I got, Robert's really good. Rick and all his kids are really good. I mean, why would I get on it if I got somebody better? But I will, not a big deal. And this is where I'm headed with all this. My kids have done all, they've farmed, they've done every aspect of the business. Clay's not as equipment or good with mechanics as Robert is, but he still knows how to do it all. So, um, I just use that as an example. We all have our strengths, but we can all do everything. There's not a real job description for this place. We cook for our crew. Well, I do most of the cooking, but Miss Jana helps me a lot on the days that I either, she's gonna have to do two weeks because we're leaving for Reno and we still have two weeks of works left. So I guess our job descriptions here are whatever it takes to do whatever we need to do. We've got a couple of fire trucks, we get called out on fires a lot. They drop everything, go, you know. Um, we do a lot of prescribed burning, or try to when the weather permits. The last five years have been pretty tough. We, we don't do much of our own farming anymore. I, I have a gentleman that helps me and he's got a big tractor and we don't have to own a tractor. But again, we have had, I think we have a lot of, that's a good situation. Mm -hmm. Surround yourself with good people. It is, and, and we all seem to get along most of the time. And you get a disruptive person, and you find out pretty quick. And you know, typically they don't last very long. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, we've had some turnover in certain places, and um, I think, honestly, I think right now, probably is probably everybody that's here. I don't foresee anybody leaving very quickly. Do you still find some time for horses? Oh, I do, absolutely. Yeah, because I've got, I have, I have a fraternity horse. So I get up at one o'clock with these guys and I've got a derby horse. The mare I did so well last year with, I'm gonna show her the derbies. We didn't get to go to the stakes or Paso Robles because we were so busy. But we try to go to the NRCHA premier events. And Robert Robes, he goes, his, uh, he started dating a girl that ropes really good, so they've been going to a lot of the U.S. Ropens or World Series or whatever. So, oh, I do. I ride every day. Mm -hmm. I will be horseback every day. The mare I went to pick, put up was the mare that I won the, so much on last year. Uh, didn't have time to get to her this morning because I have to, I have to confess, you can edit this part. I, yesterday was really just one of those days. I had three or four things going on, and... I had a big old cup of coffee, so I wasn't really tired about seven when I should have gone to bed, and we had a situation I was kind of watching for somebody to come in and out. And so I went to bed. Everything I do, I usually just flip my alarm. 
This morning I was kind of laying there, not quite awake, thinking, God, I wonder how if my alarm's going to go off. I just probably ought to go ahead and get up. Jump up. It's 4 o'clock. All the lights are on because we turn all the arena lights on. Look at my clock. Grabbed a shirt and a pair of pants and go running out, calling Robert, going, I'm so sorry, I'm so late. They said, we can hear you without the phone. <laughs> 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 they were in the arena. Both Aaron and Robert were so worried. They said, well, maybe we ought to call her and make sure she's okay. <laughs> I overslept this morning. But two or three hours of sleep, I guess, finally caught up. I mean, my body went in revolt. Maybe my arm just didn't get up there to push the alarm clock this morning. So... I said, well, it's an interview, and I said, maybe my eyes won't be so bad anymore today. <laughs> it's okay to get a little extra sleep. Well, they're, they've already quit. They are so tired this morning, I thought. And none of the horses worked good today. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those days. It's a three-year-old's will take to Reno, so you're, um, you've got three-year-olds. I don't know if you're familiar with the range cow horse, but mm -hmm. what it does, you, you participate in actually three events. You cut on them. You do the reining pattern like a reiner. And then you do what they call go down the fence. And one cow gets turned out in the arena. You hold him at the one end of the arena, which is called your boxing. But it's really, for the fence part, it just get control of the cow. And then you take him down the fence, going at high rate of speed, turning one of each ways. I'll show you some, well, so you'll understand. Turning one of each ways, then taking the middle and circling both ways. And then you're done. So you have to have a horse in a snaffle bit, which... It's a little different. Be able to train for three events, not just one. And our fraternity's in September. Uh, six weeks away. <laughs> Soon. So we're all um, yeah, in high fraternity mode. Because this is, I mean, for instance, I won $23,000 out there last year. First place in the Open pays $100,000 hmm. to win it. Erin was second. Uh, she's training out of her barn now. She won over $80,000. So... Big payday, but for us as breeders, the payday is people seeing our horses in action. Hopefully, we have people coming in wanting to buy prospects because we'll raise 30 colts a year. Mm -hmm. So, our our incentive to be participate in those events, yes, it's for the prestige and for me at my age and what I do, I love doing that. I can still do it, and it gives me a I like goals, and I like to set, and it, I, I just, that's, as long as I can, as long as I can, I'm going to. You like the competition, don't you? I love it. I, I do. I, I love the competition. My knees aren't very good, and I've had a lot of issues with them. Um, probably will have to get them replaced at some point in time, but so be it. I'll find a downtime and get it done and go back again. But I think... Uh, and I like working horses. I like, uh, and, and, and for, for what we have done as far as our broodmare band, we have capitalized on the mares daddy bought back in the 40s and 50s. And our, we have daughters, granddaughters. I mean, it's not only is our family operation old, our broodmare band is, I mean, it's a family. And it, when Miss T was inducted into the AQHA Hall of Fame, I said, you know, we have her daughters, her granddaughters, her great-granddaughters out there. And I said, you know, I, I didn't even think about it till I got up here, but I said, it's our family and her family. It's, it's, um, I'm big on families. We do business with Stillwater Milling, which is a family operation. We, all of our bull people, our bull, bull providers have been in the business a long time. Family operations. I mean, to me, you have that integrity. You have that commitment to what we believe in and I like dealing with families. Well you know you've you've won awards and honors and you've been the first in several things. No eye rolling, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, first woman to serve as president of the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association, all kinds of stuff you've done. Is there is there something when you look back that you just, you think, wow, that was really special, or was it just another day at the office? I think everything's been special. Probably, I think, one of the most special things for me was the Calgary Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Because that was, that's a really funny story. Pat Riley calls me one day and says, 
Terry, this is Pat Riley with the Calgary Hall of Fame. I thought she was calling wanting money. So I said, yes, ma'am, you know, sure. And she said, we, we have, uh, I'm honored to give you a call and tell you you are going to be inducted in the Calgary. I said, what? I said, what are you talking about? I said, where did the back come from? I argued with her. Totally and completely. Well, Pat made me tell that story the day we were, I wouldn't believe her. And so, I mean, after about a 30 minute conversation, I said, all right, I'll, who put me, who, now who did this? And what was this? <laughs> I mean, we went on and on and on. Um, when it finally soaked in, that was a tremendous honor and that was very, very special to me. Um, being president of the Oakland Cattlemen's was very special because I followed my daddy around when he was very involved, and my cousin Ella Sfrini was executive director for a while. And all the men that had been president were icons to me. Just John Hughes, and I mean, I, I the name Duty Rowe, and so many men that were uh, Ray Kimsey. I just I can't Ray Finney. Uh, that was a good friend of Daddy's, and. I'm not going to keep naming names because there's not anybody I don't feel that way about, but to put me up there, I don't think I ever really felt like I felt like they did. Not that I wasn't as capable, but I just somehow still had that. These people were, if I hadn't grown up with them, and yes sir, no sir, Mr. Hughes, you know, I may have felt a little different, but. It was a tremendous honor. I was cannot even express to you how honored I was to do that. It was, and especially that I see my name with all those people, I'm thinking, hmm, not really sure, but that was, that everybody had the confidence in me to do that. Well, do you make it back to Stillwater much? No. In fact, have Clay someday tell you the story. He says, yeah, everybody's mom was bringing stuff up here. Did you ever come? I think we, I went up there twice. <laughs> The whole four years he was there, moving in and moving out. <laughs> I don't, it's not on, and Julianne, to tell you the truth, this operation is, requires so much, and for me, um, we used to let all, every, all the barn, the people that help us in the barn off on Christmas and Thanksgiving. We cleaned stalls Christmas Day and Thanksgiving for years. And finally, we said one day, no, we're going to take the day off, or we're going to do this, because I always have all family, so we have big cooking and meals. And, uh, but I guess either I'm nuts or not, but if anything, I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to leave, mm -hmm. because there is a lot going on, especially with the horse part of it. So much of it is has to be done every day. I just don't leave well. So I no, I don't get away, and I don't... I don't do probably a lot of the um, committees or councils or things that um, I was asked to try to be served with the American Corridors Association. Don Treadway called and he said, I'd like, wish you would come up and come through that. And I said, I don't, I don't have time. Now I want to show, I want to go do this. I'm limited on what I can do now. I mean, I'm 62, or six, will be 62 years old this year. So I don't, I put a lot of that on the back burner. I want to go do that now. That's my choice. I don't know if it's good, bad, or indifferent, but that's kind of what I chose to do. Mm -hmm. So no. 24 hour operation. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much so. Uh, came up for homecoming one year. We, I was awarded, had an award and got, but didn't even make the football game, listened to it on the way home. <laughs> it was awesome, but I didn't even stay for the football game. So I I had the world's worst. When I go somewhere, my first thought is, okay, when can I leave and park this far back on, I'm pathetic, ask anybody, they'll tell you. It's I have a real reputation on that. <laughs> uh, Do you have many OSU grads in this part of Oklahoma? Oh, I don't, yes. Southern Oklahoma has a lot. Okay. Yeah, Arden area mm -hmm. a lot. Um, probably don't know as many in Duncan. Just I do too. I I just go to thinking of yeah. There's a lot of OSU grads down here. Mm -hmm. Pretty solid. Way more than where at other university. I'm sure. 
certain. Our church is even that way. <laughs> we laughed. We said, one day we ought to invite, and we are in a big church. We ought to do all the orange on one side and all the red on the other. So, um, good rivalries. Mm -hmm. Blessed to live in this state where we have that opportunity. You've been in Jefferson County for some time. 16 years, I think. Have you seen many changes over time in this part of the area, this part of the county? Uh, Warica's suffered a lot, mm -hmm. just as small rural towns are. We did find out we get to keep the hospital. Um, I know there's been some private money come in, but I think there's going to be an opportunity to do that. I think um, lots of concerns for me. I am totally opposed to the sustainability thing. I, I, I'm not sure where we're going with that. I probably am, don't need to expound a great deal on my views here on this, but agriculture is becoming such a small, it always has been a small part in the last 30 years because people are so removed from their food. So many people don't understand. And now we've got social media constantly touting things that people believe without vetting it. Mm -hmm. GMOs, antibiotics in food, so many issues. And I try to stay as involved as I can with things like that because I think they're very important. And I've got some good friends that are very adept at putting things on social media with good information on there. I just don't know that we always get it into the right hands. And I have found that even though you get it in the right hands, there's a real big percentage of our younger people that won't listen to anything that they don't want to listen to. Mm -hmm. In other words, if they have their opinion about the GMOs, even though, even though there is <coughs> plenty of scientific evidence that say <coughs> they're fine, and how are we going to feed the world without them, they're not going to do it. And, and my perspective is eat organic. You choose that. Don't push it on everybody else. Let everybody else make their choice because we have a lot of people to feed. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of work to be done. I got involved in the uh, Chisholm Trail situation here and property rights, huge issues. I mean, I don't, we, it was the government declaring the Chisholm Trail as a national park, or national, national park, national trail, I'll say it right, <clears throat> part of the national park system. And we fought it. Well, it runs through your land. Right smack dab through it, all through Jefferson County, back to Jefferson County and changes. Back to Jefferson County, and there's a lot of young people that are going to stay here. I see a lot of people, <clears throat> the, the, Jam's husband, in fact, is mayor of Eureka. A lot of people that really care. And, you know, I think if, if there's just not a lot of money here, that's the biggest problem. Jefferson County doesn't have a lot of money. Um, I think we're one of the less fortunate counties. Life is doing that. Been doing so good. <clears throat> but I, hopefully, hopefully, uh, a lot of industries left. Mm -hmm. We have a very good young man. We have two really good candidates running for state senator down here: Chris Kidd, and Tony Hassenbeck. I wish they were in two different places. I've known Chris since we got here. So he had helped keep my kids, so I'm going to vote for Chris. But <clears throat> I, let's, we have to be optimistic that things are going to be all right and positive. And <clears throat> it's just tough. Mm -hmm. But since when have we all, as Americans, not gone through tough times? Yeah. So just you just dig down and dig deeper and keep putting one foot in front of the other. and Just don't give up. Looking back at your time at OSU, how did earning your degree impact your life? Tremendously. With that, it, the connections I made, the people I made, um, the education I received, but, but mostly for me, I mean, education was wonderful, it exposed me to so many different things, but it was the people, the people at OSU that have had an impact that time. Can, and continue to have an impact today. Alumni, um, and now we have a chance to give back because 
we're trying to be very involved in the, I was on the equine council. <clears throat> so hopefully we can give back. We've gotten in a position to where financially we can do things. And so the next generation of kids coming up there will reap benefits from what we've learned and what we've been able to do. I think Oklahoma State has got so many great alumni that cares that had such good experiences that we want everybody to have those experiences. And, um, for me, um, I hope that OSU still has an impact on me, not only as a school but as an alumni, and that I can give back as much as I've been given. Well, we, we find when we speak to alums that they have this loyalty about OSU. Um, what do you think it is that sparks such loyalty? I don't know, but you don't see it in a lot of schools. I don't really know what it is, but I can remember the first time I walked on that campus. I didn't know anybody. And it what didn't take me four hours, and I thought I knew everybody. Exaggeration in some respects. But that whole, you still hear it today, so it wasn't just when I was there. It's a caring, it's a, maybe the loyalty is part of, I think for us growing up in agriculture, loyalty is really important. And so Oklahoma State, coming from that background originally, cultivates that. And maybe you don't see it outwardly. Maybe it's not something that just says, okay, be loyal. It's something that people who go there, you feel it. I don't know how to explain it, but it's cultivated there through people, through the campus, through alumni through people that um, through through everything that it's done you just even take the way the campus has evolved there's so much uh, so much giving back and so you see this on a regular basis that people who come gone been there they they keep giving they keep adding they keep making it better well don't don't you think it when you see that you think mm, I want to be a part of that I want to be a part of something that is lasting something a part of that makes people want to come back that makes people want to return that makes people want to give back what they've been given so I think they cultivate loyalty don't know how mm -hmm. but you don't see it other places and there are other schools that are probably like that. I can think of some, but not so much the way that Oklahoma State is. Well, we've kind of hit upon all kinds of different things. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it was great. Um, is there anything you'd like to add before we close on out? Oh, gracious, I would have no earthly idea. What all have I rambled on about? <laughs> I told you I was a rambler. <laughs> Well, we appreciate your time today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. Oh, tickled to do it. Thank you. You bet.